everybody. Welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird Movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube. This is episode number 137 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we're going to take a look back at Thanksgiving, especially during World War II. But before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, take a second to like, share, or subscribe, and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click that bell icon and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when they go live. Now, Warbird Tube is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about CAF, our events, aircraft, local units, or how you can join the fun, just visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. Well, tonight, as you're... Uh, hopefully taking a break from your, your Thanksgiving Day uh, preparations, whether it's cleaning the house or uh, getting some of the, the food or, or desserts ready to go, we're going to uh, take a look back at the history of Thanksgiving. So before we talk about World War II, we're going to go back even further. In fact, uh, we're going to take you back to the uh, very early colonial times. The Pilgrims and the Native Americans shared a feast that, uh, of course, laid the foundation for the Thanksgiving meal we know today. In 1621, after a very challenging year marked by harsh conditions and a difficult harvest, the pilgrims joined the Wabanak people to celebrate the very first harvest. And this event is often considered the very first Thanksgiving. Now at this historic feast, most likely the menu didn't include turkey. It was probably venison, waterfowl, fish, fruits and vegetables. There were turkeys in North America at the time and they were pretty plentiful in the Northeast but most likely not on that menu because they were hard to catch at the time and their meat was often tough. They hadn't quite been domesticated yet. So through the years, the nation expanded westward and new cultural influences emerged, but Thanksgiving gradually became a symbol of unity, a day when people from different backgrounds could come together and celebrate their shared blessings. Now in the 1800s, Sarah Buell Hale, editor of Goodley's Ladies Magazine, or Ladies Book, was a major influence in shaping what we know as today's modern Thanksgiving tradition. She often wrote of uh, lavish feasts, including a roast turkey, and uh, her writing not only influenced uh, Thanksgiving, but also the way that people saw their homes in the mid-19th century. The ideals of a perfect home and a perfect holiday came through her writing. She advocated for Thanksgiving to become a national event, and in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln declared it a national holiday, designating the final Thursday in November for the celebration. Now that would hold true until 1939. President Frank Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt stirred up a Thanksgiving tradition, a controversy in fact, that would divide the nation and families. It would ignite a heated debate about tradition, economy, and government intervention. Now, see, he was faced with a unique calendar situation that year because Thanksgiving was on the last day of November. And Roosevelt thought that in an effort to boost the economy during the Great Depression, he declared that Thanksgiving should be celebrated a week earlier on the third Thursday of November. Well, as you can see from the calendar, that's uh, another week into Christmas shopping. And he was hoping that uh, by doing this, he would be able to jumpstart the Christmas holiday and, and hopefully bring merchants out of the Great Depression. The decision, uh, known as Franksgiving, and the Franksgiving controversy for the next several years, was mixed with uh, support and opposition. Proponents of the change argued that an earlier Thanksgiving would just provide an earlier extended shopping period before Christmas, stimulating resale, retail sales and boosting the economy. Not everybody agreed. Traditionalists, including many state governors, were quick to express their displeasure. They argued that Thanksgiving had long been celebrated on the final Thursday in November as a nod to the historical roots of the holiday. Of course, the exact date of that first Thanksgiving is pretty vague, so the tradition argument only went back about 80 years back to President Lincoln in 1863. So the controversy in 1939, which continued until 1941, ignited a state-by-state -state dispute. And as you can see from this map, some regions chose to follow Franklin Roosevelt's lead and others stuck to the traditional last Thursday observance. Three states decided 
one Thanksgiving was not enough and actually celebrated both Thursday Thanksgiving. Now, can you imagine the confusion, especially for families and businesses and schools that happen to operate across state lines with a state that didn't take the same Thanksgiving day as your state did? Well, this disagreement, as I said, went on for a number of years, but in 1941, Congress finally intervened to settle the matter. Earlier in that year, reports had shown that the date change had little, if any, impact on retail sales. So Congress established Thanksgiving as the fourth Thursday in November, regardless of whether it fell on the last day of the month or not. So that traditional Thanksgiving dinner that uh, we enjoy today is a culmination of traditions, blending of Native American, colonial, and later American influences with a little political controversy thrown in for good measure. But the meal still serves as a reminder of our shared history and the power of coming together to give thanks. One of those powerful images that we often associate with Thanksgiving is Norman Rockwell's Thanksgiving. This painting is actually entitled Freedom from Want, and it was part of a four-piece series illustrating the four freedoms from President Roosevelt's State of the Union Address in 1941, in January of that year. Roosevelt outlined four freedoms. They were the freedom of speech, freedom of worship, the freedom from fear, and of course, the freedom from want. Now, these are rather vague and abstract concepts to many, but the government used these paintings to help boost patriotism during the war. They were published in March of 1943. And it's interesting to note that this enduring piece was viewed in a very positive light in the United States and still is. But in Europe, it was not quite as well received. In fact, Norman Rockwell himself felt mixed emotions about uh, the painting, saying that he had misgivings about such a large turkey and so much opulence when much of Europe was starving, overrun, and displaced as World War II raged on. Rockwell noted that the Europeans resented it because it wasn't freedom for want for them. It was overabundance because that table was so loaded down with food. But back here on the home front, the government encouraged distribution of this painting because they felt it improved morale and reminded all of us what once was and what could be in the future once the war was over. Like many pieces of art, draw your own conclusions, but remember the times and the impact that this piece had on America. Life on the home front changed dramatically during World War II. Rationing became a wartime necessity and a way of life for every household. Families across the nation were called to make sacrifices in the name of a greater cause. A rationing system targeted a range of essential goods, aiming to ensure that everyone had access to their fair share. Commonly rationed items included food staples such as sugar, meat, butter, and coffee. Additionally, non-food items like gasoline, rubber, and textiles were subject to rationing to support the war effort. The measures were not only about resource conservation, but also had a dual purpose of preventing inflation and maintaining morale on the home front. To reinforce rationing, the government issued ration books to each citizen containing coupons that corresponded to the amount of goods an individual or family could purchase. The rationing system required each person to carefully manage their resources and make choices about how to allocate their coupons. Prices were also regulated to prevent speculation and ensure that essential goods remained affordable. Now, the rationing system was not without its drawbacks. There was a thriving black market where people attempted to circumvent the restrictions, but the majority of systems adhered to the regulations, recognizing the importance of shared sacrifice in the war effort. Now, in addition to rationing, the United States and several other nations launched creative initiatives like scrap drives and victory gardens. Scrap drives encouraged all of us to contribute to the war effort by collecting and donating materials that could be recycled into crucial supplies for the war. Common items that could be recycled during these drives included rubber, metal, paper, and kitchen fats. These materials were repurposed for the production of weapons, vehicles, and other necessities. Although first introduced during World War I in 1917, the victory gardens of World War II were more plentiful. Imagine this, about a third of all the vegetables produced by the United States came from victory gardens during the war. And the produce from victory gardens helped lower prices of vegetables and the US War Department 
helped feed the troops, thus saving money that could be spent elsewhere on the military. By May of 1943, there were 18 million Victory Gardens in the United States, 12 million in the cities, and 6 million more on farms. The Victory Garden movement also united the home front. Local communities held festivals and competitions to showcase the produce that each person could grow in their own garden. Recently, during the CAF Aviation Discovery Fest in Dallas, I had a chance to talk with two members of the Women's Vintage Society of Dallas to get their perspective on Thanksgiving during the war on the home front. <laughs> Joining us now is uh, Allie Blackney of the uh, Women's Vintage Society of Dallas. And Allie, we're going to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving and how things were different during World War II than they are today. So yes. start us off. Uh, there wasn't an aspect of Thanksgiving that wasn't left untouched right. by World War II. I mean, everything about it. Um, obviously, I think one of the biggest aspects was like how it impacted the people and the soldiers. Uh, obviously, the men left in droves. Mm -hmm. and uh, But you had the people who were already overseas, and then you had the people who were being trained at home. And one of the really amazing parts is that people in local big cities or small towns opened up their own private homes to soldiers who were at training camps mm -hmm. or they were about to be sent overseas and they were just like, well, if you can't go home, then come to our home for a home cooked meal. And yeah. that was one of the really more awesome parts about the soldiers. And so, yeah. And also uh, during this time, uh, there, people didn't necessarily travel or they yes. couldn't really travel couldn't really because travel. the trains and, and all public transportation was right. really focused on the military. It was very much so because the military got first dibs to everything mm -hmm. and that included the rubber for tires and the gas and for, you know, gasoline. And uh, so a lot of people didn't were able to travel at home and uh, like, because like if you did take a train ride, it was very limited and they packed the trains as much as they could. And then since gasoline and tire were rationed, people couldn't take the long road trips back home to their families mm -hmm. so uh, that's when a lot of families you know during the war they just stayed home and had their own private little secular thanksgivings excellent and with um thanksgiving and the, the soldiers being invited how did they how did they manage to do that how did they pull off the logistics of of making these invitations I, I without it, getting like 20 guys <laughs> showing think, up at your house i think the, a lot of towns and cities had their local war committees mm -hmm. and i'm sure they probably got affiliated with the commandos and co's in camps and nearby training camps being like we've got this many families willing to invite soldiers into their homes like how many troops are you wanting to send and so they i think there was a lot of affiliation between those excellent Allie, tell us a little bit about the uh, picture you're holding um this is a cover for the household magazine uh, and it is the ninth. It was the November 1942 edition, and it's and it's focusing on a uh, a happy couple with probably her mother showing the uh, the turkey, which is actually there was a scarcity of those. But I just thought it was a very precious because we've got the war bond stamp in the center and everything. And it's like I actually think the special part about it is that they're showing what Thanksgiving should be, what it, they wanted it to be, to like help kind of pick up the mood because a lot of Thanksgivings did not look like this during the wartime, so. Excellent. And how did you get affiliated with this group? Uh, I met them at Wings Over Dallas, actually, and okay. um, uh, it was just, I had just started doing vintage, and uh, but I'm an aircraft mechanic by trade, right. and my dad was the one that inspired me to go into aviation, and uh, he says, hey, there's this old World War II air show, and I came. 2018 that okay. year and then I saw the group set up and then I joined them and that's, I've been with them ever since. Great and what kind of uh, aircraft do you work on? Um, I actually work a government contract for the Air Force. Okay so you get all sorts of good stuff. I do. Okay <laughs> you can't talk about it? No I can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm not allowed. <laughs> Allie, thank you for uh, sharing some insights into Thanksgiving in the, in the 1940s. Very different than what we have today, but it was a different time, and uh, it really when the country all came together uh, mm -hmm. for one cause. All right, thank you so much for having me. Joining me now from the Women's Vintage Society of Dallas is April Trotta. And April, I understand you're sort of an expert on rationing and the things that happened during World War II, and it's sort of a kind of forgotten uh, factor of the, the home front is that not everything was available uh, to everybody. So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Um, I think it's forgotten because we're like, poof, we have the yeah. food. But um, from milk, butter, egg, cheese, um, things were rationed. You had only a certain, I mean, cheese was probably a, a little block, meat. So they had to be really creative to do things like meatloaf. Mm -hmm. 
if you didn't have meat, you're doing with liver, beans, cereal, oats, and your one egg. If you lived in England, well, you know, you only get that one egg per adult. Yeah. Um, and you only have just a little bit of milk. And I think people forgot how to use what you have to make the best of it and watch it stretch. Mm -hmm. So the home front for a mom and using things and making sure it really stretched out was very important for them. Yes, and I understand in some cases neighbors came together to kind of share Shared rationing. a little piece. I think it was like, uh, well, today we do phone calls, but mm -hmm. it was more like you do the bread, I'll do the potatoes, and everyone had their piece where they would come and bring a dish, and it was all on the table, and they were just very thankful for everything that they had. Yes, and the, uh, the rationing and the couponing and things like that started not widespread in 1942, 43, but got more intense, as it were, as the war went on. Yeah, because majority of the stuff all went to the military men. Um, so you have your, you know, your victory gardens. But if you had 60 points, let's say, and your can of green beans were like 10 to like five points, there goes half your points right there. Right. So you know, I mean, I think they really came together in a time and used their victory garden mm -hmm. and made a little into a beautiful thing back then. Good. Can you explain just a little bit about the points? How did that How did that work? Um, just the point system, it would be depending on where you live pretty much and how, what, did you get a new book every week or every month? It really just depends. But if you, like I said, if you had 60 points and you go get some cans, you have cans that were from five to 10 to up to 15 points. So you have to think, okay, I have 60 points. You want green beans, you want this, you want that. 10, 20, 30. Yeah. So now you have to use up your rest, your rest of it for whether the meat, the cheese, bread they would do at home. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have that, you use your applesauce to make the best of your better <laughs> stuff. <laughs> there you go. Have you tried any of the recipes uh, from World War II in the ration? I have. And? Some are good and some are nay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have to say meatloaf is probably one of my favorite, but there's three types of meatloaf. Okay. I do the one that there's half uh, ground beef and half turkey. I haven't tried the beans, the cereal, and that yet. Okay. I should. And then I'll get back to you on that. Okay. <laughs> How well that is. And on the failure side? Um, I, I mean, I wish I had my book with me. It's a big old book, uh -huh. to be honest, and a lot of great recipes. A lot of things that we already have in our pantry mm -hmm. that we never use. We have it and we don't think about it. So to see, I'm like, oh, I have this. I can make a lot. But thinking I have to go to the store and get something else. It's already from vinegar to oils to lard, everything's already in our pantry. So it's kind of interesting to see that. Great, and how did you get involved with the uh, with the society? Um, well, kind of during COVID, I was sitting down watching TV on YouTube and poof, and there they were, the Women's Vintage Society. Um, a young lady was showing on her fashion and stuff. We were moving to Frisco. I knew there were only 20 minutes for me, and we came to Wings Over Dallas my first time two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I just kept growing with just the history, the fashion, more foods, and just really loving the whole thing about the 40s. Great. Well, we are so happy to have you here at, you. at the uh, Aviation Discovery Fest because this is sort of an area of World War II that doesn't always get talked about. I mean, oh, we talk yeah. about the airplanes and the equipment and uh, overseas yeah. deployments and things, but there was a lot that went on at the home front that uh, had to keep going yeah. to make sure the war effort was sustained. No, and it's true. I, just talking with everyone today mm -hmm. and just talking about, oh, you probably only had this much or the little kids, they were quite interested on like, well, what did I get to do? Well, you probably had your, you know, breakfast. You went around collecting tires mm -hmm. and metals and things. You see all those planes and tanks. Your mom pretty much did those and built those in 2000. We're getting sent out by women and, and just watching how everyone came together in a time where it was hard, but it got through and victory and win in the end. So. That's true, that's true. Thank you, April, and thank you to all the uh, ladies who are here from the uh, Vintage uh, Society of Dallas making the home front come alive for us here at the Aviation Discovery Fest. As April mentioned, there were uh, some items, especially food items, that were rationed using a point system. So uh, each person received a certain number of points per month. They could spend them on a combination of available items. Now, uh, some ration books were red and some were blue. Red stamps were typically for uh, meats and fats, while blue stamps were used for processed foods. The allocation of red and blue stamps varied based on availability. The one you're looking at here is actually a gasoline ration book. So creativity and ingenuity were pretty necessary to uh, adapt to the restrictions of rationing. Thanksgiving, as April mentioned, was a great example of this. 
People tried to uphold the traditions, but used creative recipes and sharing food items to create a makeshift Thanksgiving dinner. And often neighbors pooled their rations for communal Thanksgivings and sometimes cookware as well, because there were very enthusiastic uh, scrap drives and, and often the mom might have found some of her good cookware being donated to the cause. Now, food wasn't the only item in short supply because many families were missing their fathers, sons, uncles, and cousins and other family members who were serving in the military. Thanksgiving might have been celebrated, but not in the ways that this generation had experienced before. World War II presented some great challenges, not only on the home front, but also for the millions of servicemen uh, far from home during the holiday season. Despite the physical distance, efforts were made to bring the spirit of Thanksgiving to the soldiers, providing a sense of comfort and connection amidst the turmoil of war. For those stationed overseas, Thanksgiving found themselves in unfamiliar, often hostile environments, far from what they were used to and the comforts of home. The absence of a family and that traditional Thanksgiving feast intensified the longing for the warmth of home during this time of year. But it wasn't all bad news because the United Service Organization, or USO, played a crucial role in helping boost morale. They did that during Thanksgiving and year round as well. USO organized special shows and entertainment programs like this one featuring, uh, you can tell that knows it's Bob Hope, <laughs> to bring a taste of military to the military, or a taste of home to military bases and encampments. Entertainers included musicians, comedians, actors. And they volunteered their time to travel to the war zones, bringing laughter and a sense of normalcy to soldiers far from home. Our military leaders, well, they recognized the importance of maintaining the morale of their troops, especially during Thanksgiving. So efforts were made to make sure that everyone had special meals, often trying to replicate the traditional dishes as closely as they could, given their available resources. Turkey, stuffing, pumpkin pie often found their ways into the menus and mess halls all over Europe and in the Pacific, just to offer soldiers a brief respite from the rigors of war. And of course, that tradition continues today with our, our current military and their celebration of Thanksgiving. So while the physical distance separated soldiers from their families, the power of the written word also played a crucial role in bridging that gap. Especially during Thanksgiving and Christmas, soldiers eagerly anticipated mail call. Hoping for letters and packages from loved ones, personal messages and those care packages containing homemade goods and small reminders of home became cherished treasures, providing comforting connection to family back home. Now, even though they may not have been back home with their family, they often formed surrogate families within their units. Many units celebrated Thanksgiving together, creating a sense of community and camaraderie. Again, commanding officers recognized the importance of fostering these connections and encouraged soldiers to come together, share stories, and support one another during the holiday season. The efforts to bring Thanksgiving to the front lines during World War II demonstrated the resilience of the human spirit. Through the entertainment, special meals, letters from home, and a sense of camaraderie, our soldiers were able to find moments of joy and connection during a time of adversity. The efforts not only list, lifted their spirits, but also contributed to the overall sense of unity and a purpose that defined their wartime experience. Many of these unique Thanksgiving celebrations served as a testament to the enduring strength and humanity that prevailed even in the darkest days of the war. But Thanksgiving also marked a poignant moment for American soldiers who found themselves far from home and held captive as prisoners of war. Despite their grim circumstances, the spirit of Thanksgiving often preserved among these men. Housed within the confines of prisoner of war camps, their sense of camaraderie emerged as they faced the harsh realities of the war together. Deprived of the traditional comforts of home or even of their fellow service members, they sought comfort in the memories of past Thanksgiving gatherings with their families. The barracks became a haven for shared recollections of familiar dishes and memories, mom's pumpkin pie, dad's cornbread stuffing, and of course that roast turkey. Celebrations centered around the warmth of home, creating a sense of unity among the prisoners. Supplies were provided by their captors and the Red Cross, but these supplies were very meager. Yet even in their scarcity, many resolved to make the best of the situation. With resourcefulness and a spirit of improvisation, they transformed their surroundings into the best they could to remind them of home. 
around a makeshift Thanksgiving table, the soldiers would gather, sharing whatever provisions they could scrounge together. A small cran of cranberry sauce could become a symbol of abundance in the midst of scarcity. As they raised their improvised glasses and they toasted to family wherever they may be. Memories of Thanksgiving gatherings back in the States came to life. And these soldiers recalled the words of family members, assuring them that no matter where they were, they were always together in spirit. To hope, to home, and the day when we'll all be free. Happy Thanksgiving. This imagined toast encapsulated the spirit of the men as they navigated Thanksgiving in the midst of the hardships of being prisoners of war during World War II. Our journey tonight will conclude in Luxembourg, an odd place to kind of go, but this is a spot where U.S. soldiers far from home in 1944 created some lasting memories by celebrating Thanksgiving and leaving a legacy behind. In the aftermath of its liberation from almost four years of Nazi occupation by the American forces in September of 1944, Luxembourg became transformed into a haven for battle-weary U.S. units seeking a break from the harsh realities of combat. Thousands of American GIs found a place to relax in Luxembourg. Enjoying the hospitality of the grateful locals, the Luxembourgers warmly embraced their American liberators, creating an atmosphere that earned Luxembourg the nickname the Paradise for Weary Troops. Many troops stationed in the north and east of Luxembourg, especially near the German border, were housed in villages and small towns. Now, despite language barriers, the people there extended their heartfelt invitations into their homes offering assistance with clothing repair, local food, and drinks. The American soldiers, for their part, introduced elements of our culture, including music and sports like baseball, temporarily transforming that war-torn landscape into a little slice of heaven. Now, as Thanksgiving approached, in November of 1944, military leaders knew that they had to organize traditional turkey dinners on the front lines. Mess sergeants were called to order, and they distributed live or frozen turkeys cranberry jelly, and other ingredients to mess halls and field kitchens across Luxembourg. It created a sense of familiarity in the midst of war. The introduction of the American culture and lifestyle also left a lasting impact on Luxembourg. The sounds of big band music and the aroma of freshly cooked turkey became symbols of hope and camaraderie. Local villagers were amazed by the American Thanksgiving celebration, and they forged friendships with the GIs, exchanging addresses, photos, and overcoming language barriers through interpreters and simple body language. After the war, Thanksgiving Day and its associated traditions have found their way into Luxembourg's customs and yearly calendar. In fact, in, 19, in 2019, the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Luxembourg, a reenactment in the village of Munchhaven brought Thanksgiving 1944 back to life. Complete with a large operating field kitchen, military vehicle displays, workshops, and nearly 100 reenactors. The event attracted about 1,500 visitors. It not only paid tribute to the 28th U.S. Infantry uh, Keystone Division, but also highlighted the enduring friendship between Luxembourg and the United States. Thanksgiving Day 1944 in Luxembourg stands as a reminder of the resilience of the human spirit and the ability to find moments of joy even in the middle of war. Plus, the cultural exchange between American soldiers and Luxembourg during this time created lasting bonds and the annual reenactment of the uh, 1944 Thanksgiving continues today. Of course, as warm as those memories of Thanksgiving were, reality would soon raise its head. The Battle of Bulge would start a few weeks later, quickly reminding all servicemen and civilians that the war is not quite over. So as we celebrate Thanksgiving this year. Please remember the war years and the many sacrifices endured by the men, women, and children, both here and overseas, and the celebrations that made this a unique period in history. Thanks for joining me tonight. And as always, if you have feedback on this or any of our shows or topics you'd like us to explore, please drop Leah Block an email at cafmedia.org. Until next time, I'm Steve Bush for the Commemorative Air Force. Have a happy Thanksgiving.